Tell we've done this before. <laughs> we yeah, we're, we're going to talk today about supply chain attack. Um, surprise, surprise. Trying to be funny to say there is a surprise within your supply chain. So I'm Warren Mercer, security researcher. And see, I'm pretty sure you're first. I knew Paul was yeah. first, but he wanted me to go first. Yeah, so my name is Paul Ascania. I'm a French guy. So sorry for, for the cute accent. It's not my fault. <laughs> it's my parents' fault. And uh, so I'm security, security researcher at uh, Cisco Telos in the same team as um, Warren. And I mainly work on APT, malware analysis, and this kind of funny stuff. And I forgot I had the clicker and I was waiting for myself. Um, my name is Warren Mercer. As Paul said, we work together in Cisco Talos. Both security threat researchers generally looking at malware, finding it, pulling it apart, trying to write some cool stuff about it. Uh, my background's network security, malware analysis, very similar to Paul's. Uh, Co-founder of B-Sides Belfast. If anybody ever wants to visit the rainiest place in the world, feel free to come along. So introduction, uh, why do we write this? So supply chain attacks are pretty in vogue the last year, 18 months. Uh, we've seen a couple going back to around 2011. We've seen some. Biggest one from the sort of top of my head earlier on was probably Target, whenever they broke in via HVAC, stole the point of sale terminal credit card information. Obviously, the last year, as Matthew mentioned, we started writing about Netya, we called it, not Petya, as a lot of people know it as. And we started writing about some of these supply chain attacks that were going on. And they're really quite interesting when you start to delve down and look at them. So today we're going to cover two. I'm going to cover one on NotPetya, stroke Netya, and Paul's going to cover one on Avast Sea Cleaner. So the point of this, as I was trying to mention there, is to try and make people understand that trusted supply chain attacks happen, and they're quite consequential. Some of these were huge, huge financial resources. Some of them were huge destructive resources. So as we step through it, we'll, we'll hopefully give you an idea of what we're trying to portray. So what I'm going to cover here is Netia, as I mentioned. Uh, started with a phone call. So we're quite lucky in that we have access to quite a lot of partner infrastructure and everything because we're Cisco. We got a call from one of our partners in Ukraine. And the partner just basically phoned up and said, something's happening. It's really bad. We think it's ransomware. OK, bye. Uh, we need a bit more than that. Anyway, so we were able to send people to Ukraine. Uh, we started talking to them to find out what was going on. And we came to the point of them basically saying, yes, it's ransomware, yes, it's bad. In the meantime, the official Ukraine Twitter tweeted, some of our government agencies, private firms, were hit by a virus. There is no need to panic. That's how you know you definitely need to panic. Uh, we're putting our utmost efforts to tackle the issue. So at this point, we were very heavily involved. Our incident response guys were on site with me, Doc, trying to assist to, to find out what was going on. So that's what we're going to step through. So what do we get? Guys, it's ransomware. OK, everything's ransomware nowadays. It appears to be targeting every organization in Ukraine. Again, seems a bit sort of impalatable. It's very unlikely it's every organization in Ukraine. Affecting this compared to a flash flood. Uh, so easiest way to explain that, mass impact hitting a lot of things at once very quickly. Uh, infection delivery and vector unknown at the time. So as I say, we got a phone call. We need help. We went and helped. And what did we find? So we found a company called Medoc. Um, I don't imagine anyone has ever heard of Medoc prior to this, because I hadn't. Uh, this actually made Medoc the most famous company in Ukraine, because now everybody knows who they are. Um, Medoc is a .NET app used for tax processing. Uh, .NET's an awful language in general, but when you try to wrap malware in it, it's even worse. Uh, it has an auto-update functionality built into the app itself. So that means the app will constantly try and perform automatic updates to ensure it's the latest version, etc. Used in various large companies throughout the world. So the original message we got was, Companies in Ukraine are being attacked. Obviously, that's important. We try to help and remediate, et cetera. But it transpired that it wasn't just Ukraine. This is a piece of accounting software used pretty much all over the world in some massive major corporations, as we'll see. So how much communication did we do? Well, when your phone company tells you you've got lots of charges, you need to stop calling international people, that gives you a good idea that you're phoning them too much. So AT&T got in touch with one of our guys and said, Please stop all this long distance phone calls. You've run up $200 bill already. And that was in a couple of hours. So we were talking to Ukraine quite a lot to keep in communication as to what was going on and what was happening and how we could help. So the timeline of Medoc. So there's a couple of timelines I'm going to go through. The first one here is 
Obviously, after the fact, we were able to realize this information. Prior to this, we weren't aware. So we go all the way back to April 14th, 2017. The first version of MeDoc was released with a back door. So that means anyone running MeDoc version 1.75 or 1.74, whatever the, the last minor update would have been, would have automatically updated to this next version. May, feature release, great. MeDoc probably thinking, let's fix all the bugs, let's push out new software. So everybody's updating, as we always encourage, always update, always patch. It comes June, then there's a version released at the very end with a back door on the 22nd. So we were in contact with MeDoc from around the 28th, I think it was, of June. So there's a back door in there, and we're quite sure of this. Again, after the fact, it's very easy to be sure after the fact. So we started looking at the back door. Effectively, what we get is a, a back door wrapped within MeDoc with five, six different distinct commands. First one being, please try and contact this update server, as I mentioned. However, if you hit a proxy, fail and don't update. So it fails back to itself and then looks for all local email instances where it can start to actually do some credential harvesting email stealing information. It will then wait and execute commands and then most of these commands would be used to actually distribute edges. So the capability to steal information, credential harvest, patch files, write files and execute files all through these command sets that were included. SMTP credentials that were being stolen, very basic script. Please take all the SMTP server info and send it across. Nothing groundbreaking here, nothing really interesting. Uh, backdoor that they were using, again, run this as a WinDL32, run it in tandem, and you'll see as we step through how this actually runs. So, again, after the fact, we were able to build a better timeline. So we realized June 27th at 8.59, server was logged on to, and a user SU'd, so gained privileged access using stolen credentials. What happened then, 10 minutes later, was the web front end was modified to redirect all update traffic to an OVH server. OVH server then started to proxy that traffic, so all updates were now being proxied via OVH, and all new updates being supplied were from this OVH server. Obviously not me, Doc. 12.31, so some three hours, 30 minutes later, connection was pulled down. Um, OVH obviously realized something bad was going on because people got in contact with them. Original server configuration was restored, and the last disconnect was received from a Latvian IP. Now that, again, false flags are very important to point out. That does not mean this actor was in Latvia. That just means they accessed it via a box in Latvia. Using it logged on and wiped everything, which makes it extremely difficult if you want to do any forensic recovery. Obviously, we are not the third party hosting company in this instance, so we weren't able to do that. But we would have liked to. Drive was zeroed out using DD. So that's the, the sort of real timeline of, again, after the fact, how we were able to build up what happened, when it happened. So what we found was Netya. Uh, we called it Netya for no, obviously, in Ukrainian, and TA, TYA being from Petya, the original ransomware this is sort of spurned from. So it has worn capability, credential stealing, ransomware activity, stroke destruction of the disk and files. So let's look at how it actually works. So the first file that we get mainly is a perfc.dat file. It contains multiple embedded resources that are Zlib compressed. So what we get from this, WMI, PSExec, and the use of two shadow brokers exploits, Eternal Blue and Eternal Romance. So as soon as this malware realizes it's on an infected system, it enumerates all local resources from a network point of view and starts to scan everything on TCP 139. The reason it's doing this is it's going to try to use Eternal Blue and Eternal Romance. So the first bit that we talk about is credential stealing. Obviously, before you try and laterally move within a, a network, you want some additional credentials because the fact that you've logged in and maybe stolen one subset of credentials doesn't necessarily mean you have capability to log in everywhere. This is a common TTP that overlaps lots of different pieces of malware. This is, it's not new. Other malware will steal multiple credentials and use them when it can. So what we find is the use of a modified version of Mimikatz Mimikatz is a legitimate tool, very handy tool. It's a very well-regarded pen testing tool. So it's not anything bad currently. But we see this version of Mimikatz, and we see the name pipe connectivity. This is how it passes credentials. Again, it's very Mimikatz. Malware collects the stolen credentials as it's propagating across. And you'll see that the perfc, sorry, the laser doesn't work, so I have to point. Uh, the perfc has a hidden export, sorry, not hidden, unnamed export, which is called hashtag one. So anyone familiar with how DLL runs, it could be an ordinal, potentially, but in this case, it was an unnamed export. So now we've got all our list of credentials. 
We've looked for tokens available via Windows API that we have access to in that machine. We then see the modified version of Mimikatz, as I mentioned. Again, so I had to do some pointing. So this is code from Mimikatz, as you can see. And this is decompiled code from the malware. And you maybe can't read that from there, but trust me, it's, it's the same thing. <laughs> can I say trust me? Does that count from a security researcher? But it <laughs> immediately knew. But it is, it's just hard to depict on the screen. Uh, again, this shows more Mimikatz overlap, so you can see all the bcrypt setup functions, and here's all the bcrypt setup functions that exist within Mimikat. So we had a very similar, not identical, but a very similar version of Mimikat being used. That's important to point out because people might expect that in their environment. I mean, you probably shouldn't 99% of the time, but some people will expect to see Mimikats in their environment, so this may not be alarming to them. So we've stolen all our credentials, and uh, we've now looked at all the machines we have access to. We're back to perfc.dat, as I mentioned, where we have all our embedded resources. We now look at how do we move on around the network. So Eternal Blue and Eternal Romance are two of the shadow brokers exploits that were released. The problem with the releasing really powerful exploits like these is anyone can copy them and use them. They don't need to know how they work. They don't even need to know how to actually put them together. They just need to know how to copy and paste functionality within their code. We then had a modified version of Double Pulsar. Uh, Double Pulsar, again, was a leaked Shadow Broker's backdoor. So they, they leveraged Double Pulsar. If you had patched with MS17010, you would not have been vulnerable to this. But that, that gets to be quite a quandary, because we've only got to this point because we patched. We've only got to this point because we updated our MeDoc, which we thought we were being smart about, because that's what people should do. However, even though this company were quite good at updating all their accounting software. They didn't feel it necessary to update any other Windows infrastructure. Take from that what you will. This obviously hit many, many companies, so that's a sweeping statement. Uh, so what do we get? We get the double pulsar. What they did here, and we'll step through, is they modified the different command codes, response codes, and actual location used within the packet. The reason they do that is it makes it more difficult for you to perform detection on already known rules. So modifications in double pulsar were around the ping, kill, and execute commands that were being issued. Now, they didn't modify it in a massively complicated way. You'll see, hopefully, you've got 23 hex, 77 x and 0c8 hex here. And they've just changed it to F0, F1, F2, so 10, 11, 12. Now, that becomes difficult if you use maybe static analysis techniques that look for code reuse or code overlap of known vulnerabilities and known exploits, or if you're using network-based IDS signatures that look for this information. Second modification they did was they changed, again, just simple bytecode changes, then the opcode. 10, 20, 30 hex became 10, 21, 31 hex. So they didn't really go out of their way to change anything. They just made sure they made a small enough change to make it a bit more difficult to detect. So what we see is the actual um, the double pulsar modification, as I mentioned, changed the offsets that it used within the SMP, SMB v1 packet. So traditionally, double pulsar used 0x1e, which was the offset ID located within the network PCAP. So if you did network IDS based detection, this would be one of the signatures used. It would look for any information being used within there. However, Netja, stroke not Petya, changed it to 0x16. This is a reserve field that exists within SMB protocol. Should not be used. It should always be 0000. In this instance, this became, for us writing any signature based stuff, easy to detect because you'd write that quite quickly. But again, you see the simple changes that they make to make it more difficult to detect. So then we get the PS exec. <clears throat> again, totally legitimate Windows tool. Uh, very handy if you're a systems administrator. You can do mass system administration capability tools with this. So we drop our perf.dat, as we mentioned before. This has three of the embedded resources, as I mentioned. Two of them are, or sorry, one of them is psexec. So we've now stolen the tokens. We've got all our credentials. We'll now use psexec to try and connect the other machines that we've scanned. And what we see is it being used as remote pipe, except ULA, to make it all silent, load a command in, and run it as Windows DLL run 32. So we go off and we run our malware, and here called it application, but we run, we run our malware. Second methodology was using WMI. So again, we use WMIC.exe. We do a remote user password pass information, and we do a process call create. 
Again, this lets me run it remotely without physically logging onto a machine because there's no way an attacker can do that. And again, we see the unnamed export of hashtag one being used again. So the encryption process, this is where obviously it became the ransomware element side of it. This is why initially it was thought to be ransomware. So we'll step through this. All the propagation techniques we've discussed are all here. It will get as many credentials as it can and it will then try and laterally move around other machines by enumerating the network as we've discussed. We'll try and escalate privileges. So we're looking for obviously admin based accounts to be able to move to more machines, etc. And we'll try and look for down here, SE debug privileges and SE shutdown privileges. This allows us to have heightened user access and privileged user access. Once we run on the machine, we'll start to encrypt all the files. RSA 2048, like most malware, it's standard encryption. Obviously, uncrackable by anyone here, as far as I knew. Someone does, we can start a malware ransomware company and give everyone their files back, which would be nice. Um, once we do that, we schedule a reboot. And if we've been able to get those elevated privileges we discussed, we'll actually destroy the MBR. So if we've got SE debug or SE shutdown privileges, we'll destroy the master boot record on physical drive zero, so the first drive that the machine loads. Or we'll destroy the first 10 disk sectors, regardless if we've got administrative access. What's really interesting here is we're not really concerned with encrypting the machine, really. We want to trash the machine. We want to break the machine. Yes, we'll encrypt all the files, and that's fine, and we'll look like ransomware, as you'll see in a moment. Ultimately, we wanted to trash these machines. So this cost Maersk 300 million in terms of lost revenue. Uh, Merck, the pharmaceutical company, it cost over 300 million in terms of what impact they had. So that alone across two companies is over half a billion dollars, all because someone compromised the supply chain and provided a a ruby version of code, a malicious version of a software update. But like I mentioned, these guys weren't after financial gain. They didn't want to ransom you. They didn't want to get any money back. They wanted to break your machine, reboot it, so that when it came on, you couldn't get at anything. And obviously, find a log clear up, because all attackers do this now. They clear their logs to make it harder to detect. <clears throat> so this is the payload. So as I mentioned, it looks like Petya. If any of you have ever seen Petya, this is pretty much a carbon copy of what the Petya um, check disk screen looks like when you reboot. Now, what's really interesting here is one Bitcoin address was used for every single infection, and one email address, which was Wolf Smith one two three four five. So. Again, they didn't care really about getting paid because similar to WannaCry, these guys had no method to actually tie payments to addresses. So everyone in this room could have paid, but I could have emailed and said, yeah, that was me that paid. Now, obviously, if anyone does no Bitcoin, we can do key sign and stuff, but my assumption is these guys didn't care. But th there, was no, there was no way to get in contact. This email address got shut down, which meant capability actually to discuss with the attacker, the attack they carried out was null and void. So genuine ransomware, um, no, probably not. Single Bitcoin wallet, too difficult to work with who's paid. Single email address, you can't actually talk to them. Most ransomware will work on the basis that they will be able to communicate with you because that's what they want to do to be able to give you private keys, etc. As I said, if they get admin, the MBR is overridden, so the disk is trashed anyway. MBR is not overridden, it will wipe the first 10 disk sectors. That necessarily doesn't mean the machine is crashed, but you definitely have to re-image it. And really, really interestingly, if you run avp.exe, does anybody know what avp.exe is? Juan Guerrero, do you know? Kaspersky is right, yeah. So if this malware found Kaspersky on your machine, it went off and wiped the first 10 sectors anyway. Now, that's interesting. Um, what was really interesting with this, it was very indiscriminate. It attacked anyone it could. You find with a lot of ransomware things like ignore Russian language, things like that. Uh, with this, it attacked everyone and anyone it could. It was wormable, as I mentioned, so it had the ability and capability to spread with extreme velocity. And it did spread very quickly. And this was the actors. Go fix your mess, I'm done. Because they did not care. They didn't want you to recover because they had no method of communication. They didn't want to give you any encryption keys back because it was all trash anyway. 
They didn't want you to have access to your machine because they tried to trash the disk. Shut down the machine and move on. So, in my opinion, the actor left like this. I'm out. No one knows who it was. Authorities still have not been able to determine who it was. They've got away fairly cleanly so far. They didn't get away with any money, but we don't believe financial gain was what they were really up to. And I will let Paul talk now. No. No clicker. No. Yeah. yeah. So. Ryan mentioned you and described you a first separate chain attacks. We had to work on it, and I'm going to present you uh, another one uh, about a tool named CCleaner. Who knows this application? Yes. Who recommends this application to a friend? <laughs> oh, friends who recommend friends. <laughs> Yeah, so for, for people who don't, doesn't know this uh, application is um, a cleaner application used to theoretically speed up your laptop and stuff like that. So it's, it's used by a lot of people. If we take uh, official number from CCleaner, it's a billion of download and used by uh, a million of machines uh, around the world. So it's, it's a very famous, well-known, and used uh, free application. It's free, so that's why it's so used. You don't have to pay to clean your machine. So one of our engine detects something wrong on, on this binary, and we, did, we decided to, to start working on it to understand if it's our engine that have issue or if it's the binary uh, that have issue. The thing is, first thing, when you analyze a binary, you check the signatures if it's signed, and in this case, the signatures was good. Everything was fine. So it was not simply a bad guy that patched a binary with malicious code, because the signatures is, is good and not corrupted. So yeah, it's weird, first thing. So we decided to, to, to spend more time on it and see what happened and what, is, uh, what our engine detects as malicious. So, as you guess, probably this binary was, was compromised, and it was specifically this uh, version of CCleaner. So CCleaner has two versions, a standalone one and a cloud one, and both versions was uh, compromised. And I, I think you never read a changelog like everybody, but you've got a history of, of uh, the binary version by CCleaner, and my talk will be about a minor bug just for information. And the good thing is they patch the uh, backdoor inside of the binary, but uh, they forget to revoke signatures. So they revoke the signatures one week after patching, uh, removing the malicious code inside of the binary. So when you reverse malware, it, you generally, first thing, you simply ignore runtime. You don't take time on runtime. Runtime are code included by compiler automatically. It's not developed by the developer itself. It's simply uh, add for performance, threat management, and stuff like that. So basically, when you open binary on IDA Pro, it said to you it's runtime underscore something, and you simply ignore this part and start to analyze after runtime in execution. The attackers did something pretty clever. He had malicious code inside of runtime. So basically, if you do your job as usually, you simply ignore this part, and you don't find uh, this malicious jump inside of, of runtime. It's something that the manual developers uh, really enjoy. He use it on several other binary too, we will see, and it's uh, a classical uh, way to, to work for, for him. How works the backdoor version of CCleaner? So first, CCleaner is executed, the binary you download on the internet. And at this time, he, the runtime is executed and two branches are executed. The CCleaner branch, the normal one, your binary work as usual, it will clean your machine, etc. And another branch uh, is executed and it's a malicious part. The first step of this branch is to check if the machine is uh, normal, not a virtual machine, not a sandbox or something like that. So first, he wait a few seconds and check if uh, it's really wait. And because generally sandbox uh, remove slip and delay, so it's a way to detect sandbox, for example. And if uh, the wait mechanism fail, the malware stop execution. So he decide it's a sandbox, I stop my execution. 
Second thing, the malware check if it's executed as administrators. Because Cleaner on normal execution is executed on, as administrators. So if you execute it on sandbox, maybe it will be executed with uh, standard users. And he decided to, fa to stop execution. If everything looks fine for the malicious code, he decided to uh, communicate to the C2 and register the infected machine. We will see later how it registers this uh, machine. How he uh, registers uh, a machine and how he uh, generates the CC, it's not the IP hard coded inside of the binary. Not really. Because, in fact, he tried to reach an IP, but this IP is, was not reachable during our investigation, and I think it's on purpose. So it failed. So at this time, he generate a DGA. So he generate domain based on the mouth. So based on the mouth, he makes some mathematic algorithm and generate uh, a domain name. In fact, he does not directly connect to this domain name, but he performs a DNS request to this domain name to get the IP of this domain. And this domain have, in fact, two IP. With these two IP, he makes some uh, byte uh, uh, swipe on it to generate the final IP. So you've got IP down. I generate my DGA based on the current month. I ask for the IP to this domain name. I make some mathematics on the two IPs. And I finally have my real IP. So it, it's something not so common, and it's a lot of effort to hide the final uh, destination. Here is the different domain generated uh, each month by, by the malware. Here is some uh, open DNS uh, Cisco umbrella uh, statistics. So you can see here August, in August, the August domain has a lot of activities. And the 1st of September, it's disappear, and here we have the September activity on this uh, September DGA domain. So, and each month we can see this kind of, of uh, modification. So, to this final IP, the malware, the backdoor the cleaner uh, application registers the machine by giving a lot of information, install software, running process, etc. We will see after exactly uh, what kind of information that are sent to, to the system. For example, here you can guess it's a Chinese machine. So, stage two. This first stage was, not, it was only designed to register a machine and get a second stage. And the attackers didn't send the second stage to every compromised machine, but only on specific targeted machine. We will see later how attackers uh, select interesting machine. So if the machine is interesting, the machine will receive a second stage. And it used more or less the same uh, techniques than previously. The bad guys took to legitimate binary and add malicious code inside of this legitimate binary. But in this case, no signatures. Of course, they didn't compromise uh, the company behind this application. They simply patch the application. Yeah. And they do the same thing. They patch the application on the, uh, in the runtime. So same thing. If you simply uh, avoid analyzing runtime, you cannot see uh, the malicious code and the malicious jump, in fact. Something. Clever from the attacker's point of view is here you got the IDA Pro graph view of uh, the runtime. And you can see here, it, last instruction is pop. It's weird first. But if you switch on text view, you will see the la last instruction is jump. In fact, the attackers use a bug or feature, it depends on the point of view, of IDA Pro to find the jump if you use the graph view. In fact, uh, IDA Pro used some metadata in the binary to define with, where is the last instruction. And the attackers go one byte later. And thanks to this simple trick, IDA cut the view uh, too early, in fact. And if you switch here, you, IDA don't cut by graph, so you can see the final jump. So it's pretty clever. Yeah, for Radare users, you don't have the bug. But I don't think someone really uses Radare. 
what is the purpose of this second stage? It's more or less the same uh, goals than the, the first one, but instead of using DGA, he connect to two legitimate, legitimate websites, uh, GitHub, perform a specific search, WordPress, perform a specific search, get the first results, make some mathematical results to generate the IP. So the approach is exactly the same, but instead of using DNS, they use two legitimate websites. The bad thing is when we analyzed and, uh, the, this case, this page was uh, not available anymore, so we were not able to generate the, third, uh, the new IP. Yeah, so Juan will speak about code similarities. And here is uh, an example where on our CCleaner first stage, we saw some, uh, I think it's custom by 64 function. And it's uh, the same than a custom by 64 function used by APT17 group 72. I don't know if you know, know this group, but a, a lot of researchers uh, s spoke about it. So as usual, code similarities for attribution is, is not 100% sure. You, we, we cannot strictly link the two stuff together, but it's always an interesting point. Command and control investigation. So we spoke about the malware itself, but something really interesting in this case, we had access to uh, the C2 panel and, uh, and the database of the bad guys. So we were able to look at the database, make some statistic, uh, understand uh, what kind of profile the attackers is looking for, etc. So first, it's a simple PHP website, no rocket science, uh, with a MySQL database. So nothing uh, really complicated. Something Interesting, uh, first, if uh, you try to perform requests on the CC, but without exactly the good uh, format, the good request, the good post, you will be automatically redirected to piriform.com, which is the developers of CCleaner. So imagine you see this weird IP on your log and you say, what the fuck? You try to connect on this IP to say, maybe I would like to see what is behind this IP. You will be redirected with on piriform.com and you will say, yeah, okay, it's piriform IP, uh, no big deal. Yeah, so here is a configuration of, uh, of the website, the uh, MySQL database. So it contains the database table, etc. So it's the users was CC users, maybe linked to CC, CCleaner, uh, database CC, and time zone PRC, same thing, I can make PRC on my laptop, so it's not a uh, really, really strong uh, proof. And here is a DLL path of uh, the second stage uh, sent to interesting target. Here is the info sent to, to, to the CC when a machine is compromised. So basically they get IP address, online time, Windows version, uh, if it's 32 or 64 bits, if the user is administrator, the domain name of the machine, the MAC address, the install software, the running process, etc. So more or less a global cartography of, of the infected system. And there is a SQL injection here. So the two shellcode, so it's a shellcode executed uh, to uh, load the second stage on, on machine. So two versions for two architectures. And here is, from my point of view, the most interesting part. So before sending the second stage, the developers implement a filter, a way to detect interesting machine and not interesting machine. It's based on two things. It's based on the domain name of the machine. So if the domain name is on my whitelist, I send the second stage. And it's based on the IP address. But uh, in this CC, the IP address filter was not used, only the domain filters. So let's see in the database this, uh, this list. Here is a list of domain that in the rest, the malware developers. So basically, you can, oops. yes, no. You can see it's mainly IT company. So for example, HTC Group, Samsung, Sony, VMware, Intel, Cisco. <laughs> uh, and Linksys, Epson, 
extra. So it's a, a lot of uh, IT company. So in this specific campaign, so the attackers on this specific CC was only looking for IT company. And all the other machine out of this domain was simply ignored. They are in the database. They can receive a second stage if the guy changed uh, mind, but at this time, they didn't receive anything. So uh, let's, let's see a little bit uh, what contains the database, what kind of data, and how many data. First thing, we only have the data of one CC. There is five from our analysis. We only have one. Second thing, we only have four days of data. Why? Because bad guys is like everybody, he fails. And he didn't size correctly his machine. And he has a full file system due to number of compromised machine. So the database explodes the file system. And he lost his machine. And he has to re reinstall it. And it reinstalled the machine four days before our investigation. That's why we only have four days, in fact. It's simply because the machine was broken. So this table is a table with uh, all the information registered by every compromised system. So you have process name and you have uh, install application. I, I, will, I, I, I will show you some statistics about install application and it can be a little bit scary. The OK table, in this case, uh, it's the table that contain machines that receive the second stage. So machine where the domain is one of the domain I list before. So 25 machines. So when we have access to the database, 25 machines was compromised with the second stage. I hide the domain, of course, but yeah. If I take the server's uh, table, it contains all the machines. All the machines with the first stage and the backdoor C cleaner. In this case, I got uh, more than 300,000 individual machines. So the guy has more or less a 1 million machine botnet uh, where he was able to do what he wants. Something difficult is CCleaner is used by a lot of individual users and company. So it was interesting for me to make a difference between individual users and company. I don't have a lot of detail on the database, but something can help me. I decided to uh, look at machine where the domain name was not null. So if the machine is bind to a domain, I estimate it's a corporate machine and not a, a home machine. In this case, I've got uh, 41,000 machines. So uh, from my point of view, a lot of uh, individual machines were compromised, but a lot of uh, corporate machines too. If I look on this corporate machine, I decided to count by domain. And typically, a specific domain, a specific entity, organization, corporation, whatever, have, uh, has 960 compromised machines inside of his network. So it's a lot of machine. When you have to deal with an incident and you have uh, 960 compromised machines, it's not really easy to, to handle. Yeah, some statistics about Windows version. So we have, it, it was really representative of the world. It's uh, some Windows 10 machine, more Windows 7 machine, and few Windows XP machine. So it's, it's not uh, amazing. It's simply a representative of real life. Something more interesting, I make some statistic about domain containing .gov. And in this case, I've got 540 machine. So 540 machines had uh, .gov in, in the domain. Of course, you can have .gov just for fun in your domain. But Same thing for bank. If I check for bank, I had 51, uh, yeah, 51 machines that contained bank in the domain uh, name. And, and this, one, uh, this one are not public, but it's interesting, I think. I decided to look at the install software on compromised machine. So first, I make some search on PLC SIM. So it's PLC simulator. So it's a simulator of SCADA system. I got 206 machines. So 206 machines compromised by this guy. He didn't care about this machine because they, they, they didn't have the good domain name. But if you look at the application, it's uh, people that have a SCADA simulator installed on their machine. 
So it's probably SCADA developers or something like that. I don't have SCADA simulator on my laptop. Something else, if you look at Modbus, so protocol uh, used on SCADA system, 209 machine. So these people have the Modbus support on their laptop. So they are playing with Modbus protocol for whatever reason. So developers, potentially developers, and this one is a, is a worse one, PLC monitor. So in this case, we are not on, on developers mode, we are on monitor mode. So this one are probably really connected to SCADA system and they are currently monitoring the system. So, and in this case, it's only nine machine. So if you look at the install implication, it's, it's a little bit scary because you have some potentially really sensitive machine. And if you cross information with a domain name, you can guess what kind of machine it is and, and it's not good. Trust me. So here's the, the end of, of the Cicliner uh, explanation, demonstration. And we, we provide you two different cases of supply chain attack and how it's efficient. If you take a uh, warrant case, it basically put a country down, so it's efficient. <laughs> In this case, the purpose was to be massive, make a big uh, shit at a specific time. In my case, it's completely different. The purpose was to compromise a maximum of a machine to filter to a really small asset and compromise a small asset to probably steal information. And it's the same technique, supply chain attacks, but two different uh, goals and at the end, two different impact. The difficulty is, I don't know if people analyze malware in the room, but it's, it's really hard on supply chain in this context because it's legitimate binary. And you never, you don't have time to analyze malware, so you don't have time to analyze all legitimate binary. When you pay a provider, generally you trust him, and you pay for that, and it's generally huge binary. If you look at Cleaner, I think the binary is three megabytes, so you cannot reverse three megabytes uh, on static analysis. Well, I cannot, maybe you can, uh, but it's it's a long time, it's very really time consuming, and basically you don't do that, and nobody do that, and this kind of uh, of campaign can stay under the radar during years, because you don't check for legitimate binary. Something to add? No, no particularly, um, just as Paul said, supply chain attacks are in vogue, as I mentioned at the start. If you use software, that you get from a third party, even if you download it from the internet, just be careful what you're getting and where you're getting it from, because this shows how massive legitimate downloads turn into a complete disaster. I mean, CCleaner was, in our opinion, clearly used to target from a cyber espionage point of view. Um, just to point out, Cisco were on the list. We had no compromised machines. The machine that we had on that list was our sandbox. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Virus Total. They were also on it as well. So Tequila Boom Boom, Tequila Boom Boom, for example, was in there too. But I just want to let you know we we didn't get compromised. Just to point that out. So yes, we feel a disturbance in the supply chain. Be careful who you're getting things from. And I say things to be vague because it could be C Cleaner software that your parents are using, or it could be legitimate accounting software that you're using across major corporations throughout the world. So be careful, and thank you.